thanks, Jason. And um, thank you for participating in the FUSE course. Now, how many people are going to take the FUSE exam here at SAGES that are in the audience? Oh, so we have quite a few. If you're a SAGES member, you can get a voucher for free. And if you come to this course, you're probably going to stand a good chance on the questions. And so this talk um, has traditionally been pretty redundant with what Amin did because the monopolar instrument really overlaps with that basic um, radio frequency energy talk. And so what I decided to do, I'm just gonna do 10 minutes, and what I did is I took the module on monopolar instruments and then I looked at all the questions on the test. And so I basically merged all those questions in. So almost every single slide has two or three sort of what the questions are in the test. And, and, and this accounts for, as Amin said, it's, it's about 20 of the 70 questions are right out of the monopolar instrument stuff. And so I'm gonna be, it, it feels a little bit disjointed because of that, but I'm gonna be giving you what's on the test. So let's roll with that. Um, so the monopolar instrument nomenclature, and, and we didn't go over all the nomenclature, but this pops up. There's no such thing as monopolar energy. It's radio frequency energy. A lot of folks will call it electrocautery, right? We're actually passing current through the tissue. Um, and, and Bovi is a trade name. It's a company's name, and, and ultimately it was an individual person's name. Um, and this nomenclature um, would be useful to know. The next big concept that I really think you've got to wrap your arms around, and Amin did this pretty well, is what the electrosurgery circuit is, right? So it's this isolated circuit. Let's just march through the electrosurgery circuit as if you were to look at a picture and there'd be arrows to various pieces of it. So we have the electrosurgery generator, which you've heard of as the ESU at times, the electrosurgery unit. And so those are the same things, the generator and the unit. So we have, and the first thing I would just say that's interesting about the um, electrosurgery circuit, so it's alternating current. So the current actually goes both ways. It goes up and down both ways. And I don't know that you need to get bogged down in that, and that's not on this test. But we always think of the monopolar instrument as really flowing in one direction. Direct current flows in one direction. And, and in module one, there's a nice actual graphic of direct current. And you can kind of get the difference between that and the alternating current. But what you're using in your OR is definitely alternating current. And so it's actually coming out of this and coming out of that and going into this and going, it's going both ways. It's kind of interesting in that circuit. But let's just look at the four pieces of the electrosurgery circuit because we got to know these. So we have the generator. We have the active electrode. So there's a wire that goes to the active electrode. The active electrode you can think of as quote unquote the Bovi pencil. That's the tool that you're holding in your hand. So the clinical effect happens right here. The patient is part of the electrosurgical circuit, right? Because the current leaves the active electrode, goes to the dispersive electrode, and then goes back to the generator. And that's the completion of the circuit. So this plug up here is not part of that isolated circuit. And so you should be able to kind of point to those and know their names. That would be useful. Um, OK, and then for, so, so what do we need to think about when we talk about the modes? So the modes of the generator, and Amin did this very nicely, and so if you have a graphic picture of the waveform, this is a continuous duty cycle, so this is cut. So you see no pauses. You see how over here on the coagulation you see the pauses? So to be able to recognize the difference between that continuous one and the one with pauses over here is just, just to visually recognize those and be able to point that out is important. And, and Amin did a very nice job of reinforcing what's important about the, the difference between these two. And this is referred to over and over again in the curriculum and in the test. What's really critical to know the difference of is the volts. So the volts is the electromotive force. And we didn't do the water tower analogy here. But power, which is your watts, is volts times current. Like, I don't want to blind you with science here. But like that's, I'm going to try to have one more equation in this. But that's it. And so when you set, if you're going to go 30-30, which I think is what most people do, who, who sets their, their generator on 30-30? Ah, so not, yeah, less than half of the room. Um, what, what 30 watts is, it's volts times current. And if you have pure cut, current is going out the whole time. There's no pauses in it. It's a much lower voltage and higher current. Coagulation, the electromotive force is really high, and this is where we get that stray current that we were just talking about in that last talk that leads to capacitive coupling, antenna coupling, all this other kind of stuff. So to be able to visually look at these two 
is important. In the next slide, simply we'll just put up the blend mode just so you can see, right? The blend mode, there's different blends, but they're simply have different lengths of pauses. The longest pause is in coagulation and 94% pause, and there's no pause in cut. So who in the back row or back in there, if you want to get the blend mode, you hit the coag button or the cut button. Which side of the generator does it come off of? So I'm not gonna like point at anybody, um, but it's the cut. So you have to be on the cut side. In order to get the blend mode, you have to be hitting the yellow button or it'd be the left-sided foot pedal. That is often a something that people don't get. Um, okay, so stray energy transfer, the traditional way we think of stray energy tra transfer is, how long do I have here, Stephanie? Oh, nine minutes, okay, so we're good. So, the traditional way, and we just looked at it at this, at, in this last talk, but I think it's important to conceptualize this. We've always thought that electrosurgical injuries only happen in the surgical field, and so I sort of highlighted this with this. Well, you know, we're, we're looking along the shaft of the active electrode or around the tip of the active electrode, but it turns out that it's probably more than that, and when you go into your operating room and you're using the monopolar instrument, we probably have to think of the whole operating room setup. The reason I say this is that, say this was a laparoscopic L-hook, which we were watching in the last presentation, right? So the shaft of that L-hook, the chances for capacitive coupling or that, that, that high voltage um, energy to go across that insulation is no different than it is along this entire wire and is no different than it is along the entire dispersive electrode wire. So you lay this wire against another conductive material in the operating room you're going to then transfer stray energy to that material, whether it be an EKG lead thing. And I think Stephanie's gonna talk later about, we're gonna maybe put in a cardiac implantable device, a pacemaker. You lay that cord over the pacemaker, there's no difference between using the tip of your active electrode near that pacemaker than there is putting either the dispersive or active electrode cords next to it. So you as the surgeon need to organize your team and arrange your operating room so that those wires are not in close proximity to an implanted electronic device or other conductive material that may um, have stray energy burn the patient. So those I think of in particular would be like esophageal temp probes. They've got wires sticking out of them, EKG leads. And then the ones that are most prominent in the literature are when they use these, and I don't use these, but the, the, um, the nerve monitors. So you're doing like a lumbar spine operation or something and they put a needle into somebody and the, and the wire goes off the needle to the nerve monitoring um, technician. Those, there's a bunch of case reports in literature where they have burns at those needle sites because there's high current concentration with those. So watch out where your wires are placed. All right, then I just have one. So you notice between that slide and this slide, all I did was change the dispersive electrode. There's not a lot of questions on this, but I just want to just think about this. We had a little dispersive electrode. When you think about the dispersive electrode, we've done this and we've looked at this in the lab, and what really happens is it heats up along this leading edge. If you put it with the shorter edge or with the corner towards the surgical field, those will heat up more than double the leading edge. Now the leading edge, when we look at this, only heats up by about two, two degrees Celsius. So it's not something that's clinically important, but I think putting it over well vascularized tissue as we just talked about, so tissue with low resistance, don't put it over conductive material, that's why you're not putting it over like a joint transplant or something like that. And then making sure the long edge is towards where your current is gonna come in that's going to be the key to success. That's how to put on a dispersive electrode. The other place they actually heat up is the tail, so the, where the wire is. So the current goes in in that leading edge, and then it all goes out the wire. So you have a little spot of heat at that back wire. It's just kind of an interesting thing. I, I like stuff like that. All right, so here we go. So variables that affect. So, so that really focused on the test questions. And when I go into the variables of, of clinical impact, again, I'm staying high level. We're going to be hitting the test questions. So anybody taking this test, here we go. Um, Power setting is obvious. We've talked about that. That's the watts on the generator, um, which is power times current, but you don't need to know it at that level. Dwell time is a variable that impacts tissue effects. So dwell time is simply how long you have your foot on the pedal or on the button, whichever, you know, the length of time that you're putting current into the tissue. Here's where I'm gonna slow down and, and show a couple slides. I'm gonna show a couple slides on current density, generator mode, Amin covered that pretty well and then we'll do the proximity one. Okay, so let's move on to current density. And again, I don't wanna blind you with science and too many equations, but this is where I'm gonna put my second equation in because I think it is worth knowing and it is on the exam. 
All right, so what we have here is we have an area that you're gonna put against the patient. And this triangle goes down to where you put a very small area, which would be a needle tip active electrode, to a very large area back here, which would be the dispersive electrode. When you pass a, a similar amount of current, you're gonna have very minimal temperature increase on the left here when you have your dispersive electrode. In comparison to the right, where you have these very small areas, you're gonna have very high um, temperature of the tissue. And that gives you your clinical effect. So the, I just have two of these, I promise. There's just, and then it's gonna end. So the change in temperature is proportional to the current density squared. And then I just wanna look at that a little bit more granularly because current density is current divided by area. And so I did this calculation. And so area, if you measure, I didn't measure a needle tip, I measured a, um, a bladed tip, which is normally what comes up in your set when you start the case. Um, that's about one millimeter squared. The dispersive electrodes are 37 centimeters squared. So it's 0.1 is a millimeter compared to 37 centimeters, and it's squared. So there's more, more than a 10,000 times temperature difference, right, between this big pad surface area and this little tiny tip of the active electrode. So recognizing that it's a squared of the area, you know, it's exponentially more, that's the concept you need to get through. So as the area of uh, that current passes through decreases, it's squared the um, relative amount of temperature that you're generating. Big concept, two or three questions on that concept. Any questions on that concept? This can be interactive. We still have three minutes here. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to generator mode real quick. Um, we kind of talked about this, so I'm not gonna beat this up too much. And Amin actually did a nice job at talking about when you have this continuous current, you get a much more rapid rise in the temperature. And because you go over 100 degrees of Celsius, you get this vaporization. That's the big concept that kind of comes up on this test. The final topic for monopolar is simply the technique, which is, you know, how you hold the active electrode tip relative to the tissue. And there's three categories when you think of this, um, uh, the clinical use, the technique. The three categories are vaporization, fulguration, and desiccation. And you should think of those in buckets, and all of those are on this test. Vaporization and fulguration are when you have a spark gap or you have a little a distance between the tip of the active electrode and the tissue, right? That's a higher, the generator is then gonna put a higher voltage out, a higher electromotive force to sort of have the current cross that spark gap. And so when you're on cut, you only have vaporization. And when you're on coag, you only have fulguration. Both settings, cut and coag, will have desiccation. That's where you touch the tissue. And I would just say in a short sentence, when you create a spark gap, your current density is really high because there's because you don't you're not touching a lot of tissue. It's just arcing over into very small places, and so you heat up the tissue much more rapidly. With cut, it actually vaporizes and the cells explode. Whereas in coag, you create a coagulum and it's a much more superficial spread. So if you understand those three buckets of of, of areas, which is vaporization with cut, fulguration with with coag, that's when you have the spark gap, and then desiccation, you'll nail those questions. All right, I have a minute for the argon beam. I had to go with the periodic table just because. Um, so argon is right over here. You learn this in college. Like this is just not that scary. It's one of the noble gases. It's in between neon and krypton. And you don't need to know that for the test, but what you do need to know is that argon is a monopolar instrument. You need a dispersive electrode somewhere on the patient. It's a much higher voltage um, monopolar instrument than the, um, than the quote unquote bovi that you use. So what argon does is it, 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 so they call it a plasma. A plasma is basically any medium in between the tip of the active electrode and the tissue. And so when you're doing open surgery, that's air. And when you're doing laparoscopic surgery, that's CO2. In this case, we're using argon. And so that um, gas ionizes and you can see it, it turns a color, you know, so it's, 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 it sees a bright light. You actually have a flow of argon that goes across there. What the test disproportionately focuses on is what the complications are from the argon beam device. And it does this in both laparoscopy and endoscopy. Because the argon beam, you have a flow of gas in there, during laparoscopy, you can over-distend the abdomen, and during endoscopy, you can over-distend the bowel 
there's disproportionately a lot of questions on that concept. You're blowing gas in, you're gonna over distend the bowel or the abdomen, or whichever you're doing. It can cause gas embolisms, and you can worry about hypotension just simply because when you over distend the abdomen during laparoscopy, somebody can reduce their, their preload and drop their blood pressure. Thank you.